This is Lime Stock, and in this video we are looking at peaceful coexistence with specific reference to the Austrian State Treaty, the Geneva Summit and the Paris Summit. So first of all we need to look at what is peaceful coexistence and why did it come about. So in February 1956 the 20th Congress of the Com Communist Party was held. And in this meeting, Khrushchev abandoned the traditional Marxist-Leninist view that there would be war between socialism and capitalism. Instead, he claimed that communism was so powerful that war was not necessary. Now therefore, Khrushchev claimed that the USSR should not unnecessarily provoke the USA. Now although this would not end the Cold War, it would move to a less volatile environment. And seeing as Stalinist aggression had resulted in unnecessary expensive, Khrushchev decided that he wanted to pour this money into domestic development. Now Khrushchev also understood the great risks associated with nuclear war. So therefore he adopted the policy of peaceful coexistence. And instead of aggression, diplomacy would be used to defuse any tensions between the superpowers. So in that, Khrushchev's foreign policy objectives were that the satellite states must be kept under Soviet control, spending on military security had to be reduced, however the nuclear capabilities of the USSR had to be kept equal to that of America, Germany must be prevented from rearming and acting as a potential threat to the security of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union must remain as the face of a socialist uh, community, especially with growing competition from China, and tensions between the USSR and the USA should be diffused using diplomacy rather than unnecessary aggression. Now the rest of this video will look at three summits and treaties which show either um, there was peaceful coexistence or in some cases where peaceful coexistence failed. And the first one to look at is the Austrian State Treaty in 1955. And like Germany, Austria had been divided into four occupation zones. And in 1954, both the Western zones and the Soviet zones worried that the other side were preparing to incorporate its zones into their military bloc. Now, Austrian leaders in Western zones also promoted the idea that their zone could be absorbed into the Soviet sphere of influence. Now, by February 1955, the Soviets showed intent on settling the issue in Austria, and on May the 15th, the state treaty was signed. Now, the treaty declared that all occupying powers would withdraw from Austria, and Austria would be a neutral state. Now this was later declared in October the same year. Now this agreement removed a potential conflict as well as showing the intent of a superpower to forge better relationships. Now the next step with these ameliorated relationships was to resume summit diplomacy which was basically finding diplomatic solutions at high level international meetings. And the next summit was the Geneva summit in July 1955. And one of the reasons for this summit was the fact that Khrushchev needed a less confrontational relationship with the US so that he was able to achieve his objectives on ensuring compliance within Eastern Europe and developing the economy within um, the Soviet Union. Now another reason for the summit was West Germany's admittance into NATO, which the Soviet Union were not overly keen about. Now therefore representatives of the USSR, who was Nikolai Bolgamin, and the US, who Dwight Eisenhower, France, Edgar Fur, and Britain was Anthony Eden, and they all met in Geneva in 1955. Now one idea that Eisenhower put forward was the Open Skies proposal, and this called for the US and the USSR to exchange maps indicating the location of their military installations. And with these maps, both countries would therefore be able to conduct aerial surveillance, thus ensuring that the other nation was in line with any armed control agreement. Now, this would ultimately take the two countries closer to disarmament. Now, while France and Britain seemed keen on the idea, Khrushchev dismissed the idea as an espionage plot. Now, in reality, Eisenhower did predict that USSR would disagree with the proposal, yet his reluctance to agree to it was portray the Soviets as a major impediment to arms reduction. Now the other proposal concerned the future of Germany. 
Eisenhower proposed a reunited Germany which had free elections and freedom, and effectively this would mean that Germany would become a part of NATO. Now the Soviets once again were not happy with this, and instead proposed that a reunified Germany should be demilitarised and neutral. Now, Khrushchev also refused to discuss the future of Eastern European bloc states. Now, overall, this summit didn't produce much in terms of any practical outcomes, but it did mark the beginning of communication between the two powers. The final summit that happened in this time period was the Paris summit, which happened in May 1960. And the year before, in 1959, Khrushchev became the first Soviet leader to visit the USA. And on September the 25th, both him and Eisenhower met at Camp David in Maryland, where they discussed a number of issues, including disarmament and the situation in Berlin. They also agreed to use diplomacy when settling international disputes. Now, this talk reaffirmed Khrushchev's faith in peaceful coexistence, but it also caused a deterioration in relationships between the Soviet Union and China. Now, it also led to the Paris summit, which took place in May 1960. And seeing as Khrushchev was committed to peaceful coexistence, despite opposition from both China and the Soviet uh, hierarchy, Khrushchev wanted a deal for Berlin and prohibiting nuclear weapons in the Pacific. Now, this was particularly unlikely, seeing as China's nuclear arsenal was close to completion by 1960 and they wouldn't want to prohibit nuclear weapons. However, the summit collapsed 13 days before it actually started, when an American U-2 spy plane was shot down over the Soviet Union. Now, when so Eisenhower refused to apologise, Khrushchev went home. Now, the next thing, which was a bit of dis a disruption to peaceful coexistence as well, was the election of John F. Kennedy. And John F. Kennedy, also known as JFK, was elected as USA's new Democratic Party president in January 1961. And in, in his inauguration speech, he confirmed that he would do whatever necessary to support the survival of freedom and liberty. And this was basically reaffirming the Truman Doctrine, which we've already talked about in a previous video, and containment. Now, ultimately, this placed a strain on peaceful coexistence as Kennedy increased the defence budget and favoured an expansion of nuclear missiles. Now, both Kennedy and Khrushchev met in Vienna in June 1961. However, little was achieved and Khrushchev became convinced that Kennedy was young and vulnerable leader whom he could manipulate. Now, this was in reinforced with the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, which happened in the same year. Now, one of the main arguing points was the status of Berlin, but after Vienna, Kennedy called upon Congress to increase defence uh, spending, call up army reservists, and reactivate ships which were about to get scrapped. On the 25th of July 1961, Kennedy also called for a build-up in NATO forces. So it has always been debated to what extent peaceful coexistence really existed between the two countries. And although there are some examples where there was obviously peaceful coexistence, such as the Austrian State Treaty of 1955, things like the Geneva Summit, where barely anything was done, and the Paris Summit, where it didn't even start because a U-2 spy plane was shot down, show that peaceful existence wasn't necessarily in full flow, and the countries, there were still many tensions between the two countries. So thank you very much for watching and see you soon. Bye.